Today we are going to open the scripture to the book, The Song of Solomon. There has been much discussion as to whether or not this book really should be in the Bible. Or does it really belong there? So I'll ask you to turn to 2 Timothy 3.16. And uh, there it says very plainly that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is what? What do we say? It is profitable for doctrine and reproof, for correction and instruction in righteousness. Now there are 66 books in the Bible and the Song of Solomon is one of them. And if all scripture is given by inspiration, it is an inspired book and it should be profitable for us to study. So we are going to look now at this very superlative, the best song of all, and we're going to see what there is in it that could be of value to us. And Ellen G. White said in The Mount of Blessings that Solomon, by the spirit of inspiration, wrote this book. So we're very happy to know that this has been confirmed by an inspired writer that this book is indeed written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And it says in chapter 1, verse 1, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. So it gives the title and the author. Now, not only is that the author, but um, I should mention one other thing. The word Solomon, the name Solomon, is made up of three Hebrew consonants. In the first place, there was deliverance from the death angel as he passed over the houses. Then there was, of course, deliverance from the bondage of slavery. And then when they came to the Red Sea, that was another wonderful deliverance from their enemies. So as we look at the Song of Solomon as a song of deliverance, and that it was typical, pointing forward to Christ, who would deliver his people from the bondage of sin, we need to realize that this book is superlative in that at the end of time, God's people will be also having three deliverances. First, they will be delivered from sin in the sealing of, the, of uh, the, what we call the seal of the living God. Then uh, they will live without a mediator, but they are delivered. They are victorious at that time. Then there is another deliverance from their enemies at the voice of God. And then the last and final great deliverance will occur at the second coming of Jesus when these bodies are translated or the bodies of his saints resurrected from the grave. They are freed from the grave and from this body of death. So we are looking back as Israel understood the Passover, their deliverance from Egypt, and we are also looking at this book as a book which has reference to the final deliverance of God's people. Now, how did the Jews actually use the book? Well, they during the Passover time, they would celebrate each day with various kinds of rituals and services. And when they came to the final day, the eighth day of the Passover, then the Song of Solomon was presented as a colorful pageant with a musical background. And they did it right out on the porch and the steps of the temple so that the people who all came into Jerusalem for the Passover, as they went from that grand finale of the Song of Solomon, they would go home with the music ringing in their ears they would see the presentation of, of the deliverance of God's people. And so this was a beautiful thing that they came to see every time they came to the Passover service. Now, we're going to look at several things about the book. And one of the first things when you study literature is that you have to determine what the genre of the book is. That's how you classify it. What kind of literature is it? Well, very shortly, you'll, if you look in any commentary, they will tell you that the book is a wedding song. It has to do with some kind of a wedding. Now, how do we know this? Well, if you will look over here 
at chapter 3, verse 11, you will see that it says, it's written almost like a, a wedding invitation. Instead of saying, you are cordially invited, it simply says, go forth from your home and come out to see. So it says, go forth, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, and behold King Solomon. Now, who are we going to behold here? Solomon represents who? who? Jesus Christ. All right, so we are ca asked here to go forth and behold King Solomon, and that is Christ with the crown, wherewith his mother crowned him in the day of his espousals. Now, what is an espousal? In some uh, versions of the Bible, it's a wedding or a marriage. So come out and see the marriage. It's like a wedding invitation. Come out, O oh, you daughters of Jerusalem, and see the marriage of Jesus in the day of the gladness of his heart. Now, whenever there is a wedding celebration, there is great joy and happiness, and there is a great deal of um, of preparation to make for the wedding. Everybody wants to put on their best apparel and uh, you have to get a minister and you have to, to officiate. You must have the house in good condition. There must be a beautiful wedding supper and there must be flowers and there are wedding gifts and there's a great deal that goes on with the wedding. If you've ever had a wedding in your house, you know what a flurry of preparation it is to get ready for it. Well, this is a book about a wedding. Now, how would this possibly be that the book is about a wedding of Jesus? When does Jesus ever get married? Let's take a look here in Great Controversy, because here it gives us a very interesting insight. I'm reading from Great Controversy, page 427. It says, The Proclamation Behold, the bridegroom cometh. In the summer of 1844, led thousands to expect the immediate advent of the Lord. At the appointed time, the bridegroom came. Not to the earth, as the people expected, but to the Ancient of Days in heaven, to the marriage, the reception of his kingdom. They that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. They were not to be present in person at the marriage, for it takes place in heaven, while they are here upon the earth. The followers of Christ are to wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding. It is in this sense that they were said to go into the marriage. So we are going to look at the entrance of Jesus Christ into the most holy place in this book, and uh, that he has gone into the marriage, and we are to wait for him to return from the wedding. So you can expect this book to have something to do with the great adv Advent movement of 1844. Now, it says that the bride here is not to be present at the wedding. Well, that seems strange, but we're also told that the Song of Songs and this wedding uh, is illustrated by an oriental marriage. Well, we were in Africa and we had an opportunity to see how the orientals, especially the Indian people from India, how they carry on a wedding. You see, in that country, in those countries, the women have no legal rights. And so when it comes to the transfer of the dowry and the properties, which they do in those weddings, there's a great deal of legal work that has to be done. The bride cannot go to the courthouse where they do all the signing of papers. She remains at home, and it's only the men who go to the courthouse, and they consider the legal signatures as the marriage. The legal part of it is the marriage. And so uh, all the time that the bridegroom is in the courthouse, his friends have, are gathering at the door of the courthouse, and they come with musical instruments, and they bring a sedan chair. 
and uh, I have seen them coming dancing down the street and the as soon as the legal work